Now, I'm going to turn the floor over to Karen. She's going to talk a little bit about what we, some of the things that we've been doing um, in relationship to geo design. Can you hear me? Okay. Oops. Okay. Um, I'm going to go through a series of, um, first of all, a, a set of drawings and, and digital images that I collected from my colleagues uh, across the country, all at public um, universities. And you will find that um, they are following a very similar process of uh, design process, somewhat different than Carl's. And um, they're you know, jumping in after the big question has been answered. But I'm simply going to relate those examples to Bloom's ta taxonomy. And I'm going to move through this very quickly because I, I'm told I have two minutes or three. So um, we are already doing quite a bit of this, of uh, Bloom's taxonomy, in our GIS classes. Many people are teaching design class using GIS. And so the lower level of Bloom's taxonomy is map making and site inventory. And as you move to the upper level skills, um, we have advanced input, collecting input on site, uh, interviewing people, generating new maps from interviews, uh, doing photo interpretation and analysis, and that's a very rich field. Site analysis, several different ways of putting together site analyses, either through suitability or just through graphic composites. Uh, schematic plans, and then stakeholder reviews. And so um, this very simple little graph shows map making is at the lower end and stack stakeholder reviews is the evaluation, and I won't go through all of those. And then here are some very pretty examples of, um, from the University of Arizona, simple mapping. Uh, many of these are just downloaded. Um, then there are derived maps, which means that you have to use the GIS tools. So that's uh, an example of Bloom's application. Um, analysis, when, you, when we put them all together, this corresponds to Bloom's analysis. Here's a different one where uh, the student has uh, applied some, some affective values and chosen the child's view of his neighborhood and selected those elements, those features that child, uh, children are interesting, interested in. And then this, there's, this is a series of three projects, a very straightforward um, uh, inventory maps, site analysis, in this case suitability analysis, leading to the diagrams over here, the, um, the design diagrams, based on these analyses, leading to a schematic plan. Again, this is an example of Bloom synthesis. Another one, a third one, um, uh, with the 3D view, which we can now do digitally very effectively. Here's an example uh, in China. My colleague Janet Sil Silbernagel worked with some Chinese colleagues uh, right after the Sichuan um, earthquake to identify conservation areas, a couple of different strategies, and then a combination in strategy number three. My colleague, uh, Wayman Lee at Cal Poly, uh, this is this fall's uh, station fire, looking at um, not just the existing conditions and the, the 3D view, but the, um, moving into the analysis of defensible space and looking at different conditions along the urban interface, uh, especially in debris basins. But more importantly, what I want to talk about is the challenges that we face. What are the things that we need to do in order to uh, really move us into geo design? What, what are the things that we're on the cutting edge of that we need to continue to develop? And among these are hand drawing. I think we all agree that we want to be able to continue to hand draw. We need to teach our students how to draw quickly, iteratively, so that they're using the right side of their brain, and then bring those images into the 3D environment. And we're already doing this. We need to further explore these 3D tools, our sketch, SketchUp, and, and view sheds. 
we need to um, really embrace BIM and integrated practice. Our colleagues in the area of engineering and architecture are very heavily involved in BIM. Many of them are moving to integrated practice. The whole design fields need to be aware of what integrated practice is. It's not just the technology. It's a matter of bringing everybody to the table at the same time and making sure that the scientists are involved, that the contractor is involved. It's, it's a very different model of construction. And then we need to develop better terrain tools. I think um, everyone who has worked with terrain tools knows that there are limitations. And our, um, my good friend Chris Ellis is working on wetlands at University of Michigan, tells me that he has to keep moving around to different tools. Um, uh, where's Randy Gimlet? He uses a different tool for, for terrain modeling. And so um, another set of challenges, integrating other technologies, integrated integration of analyses from the sciences into the design process, and greater integration of vetting tools. So the question that we're all here to answer, I don't think anybody has the answer, is this a unique profession or is it a skill? And so will we be training people or, or educating geo designers to be designers who have all of these geospatial skills or will we have geo-designers who are simply trained as technologists and they'll act as the intermediaries between the designers and the other disciplines? And that's a conversation that I've heard several times at this conference and I'm sure it'll take a while to resolve. In three minutes, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.